Starfield is this year's biggest release. Some people love it, some people think it doesn't live up to the hype, but one thing is for sure, every person on this planet owns it. Aside from you, because you're smart and you don't want to part with $120 for a game that could turn out to be just as fun as a paper shredder. So, in today's critical view, I shall be adventuring across the stars to give you a definitive answer. Is Starfield this generation's biggest hit, or is this just another in a line of Bethesda's failings? Let's gear up and find out. Bethesda has always been good when it comes to introducing players into their worlds, allowing their openings to not only set the scene for those worlds, but also the stakes that rest within them. Skyrim and Fallout 4 are really good examples of this. Skyrim, in the span of a three minute cart ride, is able to fill the world with not only agency, but adds plenty of intrigue for the player to act upon. There is a war raging between the Imperials and the Stormcloaks, what's this war about? There is a disdain for the Thalmor. Who are the Thalmor? Ulfric killed and tried to usurp the High King's throne. Who was this king and why did he deserve to die? Who is this man and will he be my friend? Lucia, no! Questions that will rattle in your head until a dragon attacks. This dragon attack will not only set up the main quest line for the game, but now you are one of the few people who has survived a dragon attack. Whilst the main quest line does make you a supposed chosen one, before you even know that, the player is made to feel unique. Unique. You feel important. You want to do the main quest line because of how much the game has hyped it up. However, Skyrim also succeeds in not forcing the player into doing things that they just don't want to do. Not only do you get to make the small opening choice of siding with an Imperial or a Stormcloak, something that you can change your mind on later in the game, but the game also opens the world up to you and doesn't force you down the main quest line. Once you escape Helgen, you can go anywhere and do anything, which is how a lot of players like to play Bethesda games. Fallout 4, I wouldn't say does this as well as Skyrim, but it does do its setting some justice through how it plans out its opening. Getting to see the suburban lifestyle before the bombs fall is a good juxtaposition on how messed up things are 200 years into the future. Don't worry, my hot wife, together we will overcome the wasteland. Hot wife, no! Much like Skyrim, you are offered intrigue through the murder of your wife and the kidnapping of your son. But once you've left the confines of the vault, the world is completely open to you. Your uniqueness in not being in a radiated mess rings true in how you interact with people of this world. The story holds importance for those who care, but for those that don't really care about that sort of thing, you have an entire world to explore. Both games offer intrigue and motivate the player into doing the main quest line should the player want to do so. By the time the world is open to them, they can go anywhere, do anything, and become whoever they would like. Remember this for later. Now with all that being said, how does Starfield manage? Now understand that I am discussing the opening of Starfield in a vacuum. When playing Starfield for the first time, you have no idea where the story plans to go. And I want to discuss the opening on its own without the understanding of where the opening leads because I do not like how Starfield opens. It is an underwhelming mess that will go on to permeate the first third of the main quest line. Understand that my opinions here don't represent the entire game. That's for the rest the video to decide. However, I need to make this clear, this is Bethesda's worst introduction to a new world full stop period good 
goodbye the end. And speaking of the end, I am at my wits end trying to comprehend how Bethesda thought that this was okay. So how does everything begin? You start off as a contractor working alongside your co-workers Lynn and Hella at an Argos mining outpost. Whilst mining away, the team gets a strange reading. When you go to investigate this reading, you touch a strange rock and you begin to hallucinate the vast reaches of the starfield. You wake up to a call from the person that contracted this group to dig up this strange reading. They are on their way to pick this material up. When informed that you touched the damn thing, Barrett, one of the members of Constellation, tells you straight faced that you are coming with him and you don't get a choice in the matter. Even if you tell him that you don't want to, the game just tells you to get fucked. You're coming with me to Constellation. You're part of this now. Whoa, wait, I didn't ask for any of this. Hey, um, I wasn't gonna bring it up, but we don't exactly know what the artifact might have done to your head, and Constellation is really the only group qualified to help. Wait, did I just get well actually into doing the main quest line? What the fuck? Barrett lets you borrow his ship so you can bring this fancy rock you found to Constellation, a small group of adventurers seeking out these supposed artifacts. So all you have to do is bring this artifact to Constellation and then you can start your own adventure. Ah. Oh. Oh, I have to do a tutorial first. Well, that's fine. This game's ship mechanics are, can be can be pretty elaborate. That's fine. Okay, I've learned how to use the ship, and now I can go to Constellation. Ah. Oh. Oh, I can't leave the system until I kill some pirates. Okay, okay, I'll kill some pirates, and now I can go off to Constellation. Oh, oh, I can't until I kill this captain. Well, that's okay, I'll fly down to this planet, kill the captain, and now I can go off to Constellation. Sweet, they have the artifact, and now I can start my own adventure. Oh, they want me to get another rock. Wait, I'm locked into having a companion that I do not want. Well, okay, uh, can I leave now? No, go to the planet and find a guy, and I can go now? No. Bribe this man for information. Okay, can I go now? No. Go fight some ships in space and grab some data from a satellite. Okay, but surely I can leave now. No. Go fight some religious space farts on a space station. Okay, but I no. Go disable this ship, board it, shoot it, kill it, talk to a guy, get the artifact, travel back to the lodge, and drop off the artifact. And now, finally, you are free to be your own person in this roleplay game. Constellation, more like constipation because they won't let me do the shit I actually want to do. Let me be clear, the opening content is good. The space combat is fast, the gunplay is punchy, and the characters are interesting enough. However, when you market your game as a space epic where you can go where you want, do as you feel, and be anyone, the last thing you should do is tell players where they cannot go, tell them what they have to do, and influence who they have to be. By the halfway point of this opening, when the galaxy is finally opening up to you, you're a member of a secret organization organization collecting artifacts that you do not care about, killing pirates that you may have wanted to join from the get-go, and being forced into having company that you can't tell to bugger off. Can you imagine how frustrating it would have been to play Skyrim for the first time and the game forces you down the path of the Imperials? Or to play Fallout 4 and the second you leave the vault, you're forced into going to find the Institute. Only 33% of players that have played Skyrim on PC ever pursue the path of Dragonborn, and only a quarter of players give a rat's ass about finding their son in Fallout 4. The main quest line is there, but Bethesda has always understood that new players and returning ones love going off and exploring their worlds. They have had this down to an art form for over a decade now, so why they decided to flip the script out of nowhere is beyond me. And getting to the point where you are finally free to start exploring without Sarah hassling you and being a mandatory companion is long. The journey to free will in Skyrim is 22 minutes. Fallout 4, a nice crisp 20 minutes on the dot. Starfield, however, with its tutorials, fetch quests, and crowded battles, even when you know what you are doing and are on a second playthrough, clocks in at a whopping one hour and 42 minutes. That is over five times longer than Fallout. Am I being harsh here? 
100%. I understand that this is a big universe, and honestly, as much as I don't like it, having you bounce around the universe a little before taking off the training wheels is probably the smartest thing they could have done. But there are better ways of getting around this. Hand over the artifact to Barrett. Hey, wanna come with me and find out what these fancy rocks are all about? No? Okay, he leaves. Have the player already have enough credits to pinch up one of the shitty mining ships and have it need repairs. You are given a waypoint to the nearest planet that can do repairs and boom, you have an area to explore. Offer up some quests that send you to other planets with the option of meeting up with Constellation later still on the table and you have a banger. But Constellation is not interesting enough on its own to be worth wasting my goddamn time. Yes, the story gets good, but the fact that the game game offers you nothing of intrigue outside of I saw a few stars is insulting. Like, buddy, you're in space. Look out the fucking window. The game offers you nothing. Go ahead, ask the members of Constellation what the artifacts are before heading off and they won't even speculate to intrigue you. You seem to know a lot about these artifacts. Oh gosh, no. I mean, that's, that's flattering, but really we're making this up as we go. Individually, they're just odd hunks of metal. Is there anything new showing up? No. Are they a weapon? No idea. Did aliens make them? Mm, it's probably best not to speculate. Is it a map to a magical treasure? Uh. The fuck do you mean? Uh! Oh, that is definitely not making it into the video. The people of Constellation do not have a reason to find these artifacts outside of the fact that they float. Buddy, my turds float, but I don't relish the opportunity to collect them like fucking Pokemon. But as frustrating as the opening is, we're here. We are finally free to explore this vast universe and start our own adventure. And speaking of adventure, I found something that I think you guys are going to want to see. You didn't think I'd talk about exploration without us going on our own adventure, did you? Let's go check it out. Starfield's universe is as vast as it is beautiful, which makes it really hard to talk about everything. So let's talk about its handcrafted content first. Before that though, please subscribe, leave a like, or perhaps comment how stupid I am to be animating segments of a video that like 400 people are going to see. Because yes, I am that stupid. As you adventure across this stunning universe, you will find yourself in shock as to how Bethesda managed to make all of its main cities so distinct, not just visually, but in the content that they hold within. Every city is rooted in its own theme and the abundance of things to do reflects that as well. Take Aquila City for example, its exterior reflects that of a futurized take on the Wild West. You've got saloons, ranches, and even a sheriff. It's great, but it's only once you dive right in that you can appreciate Aquila for what it is. Take the side quest for example, one of the first quests you'll stumble upon is you stopping a gang of bank robbers. Pull off this quest with no casualties and the game will put you on the road to being deputized. Or you could walk down an alley and you'll hear people raving on about some guy named Henry and his in-town brewed beer. But if you go off to investigate, you'll find yourself going down a rabbit hole of betrayal. Henry owns a wheat farm alongside his business partner. This partner doesn't like how Henry's been wasting a lot of his time and a portion of their wheat yield for his craft beer. They offer to pay you off to go ruin the next batch of beer. But if you feel bad for Henry and you don't want to ruin his dream, you can just increase the sugar and alcohol contents. No, really, if you go to the small local tavern buying Henry's beer. When people drink the new batch, they love it. So much in fact, that they will order so much of this beer that Henry's dream of being a beer manufacturer is ultimately fulfilled. The game doesn't even reward you for this, you just straight up fail the original mission. The reward is knowing that not only did you do right by Henry, a man that you did not even have to meet in order to do this quest, but that the city of Aquila has slightly changed due to your actions. That's so cool! If I was to talk about all of Starfield's main locations, we would be here all day. And this video, as you can tell, is already very, very long. <laughs> so I would like to focus on one of its locations, and that would be Neon. Neon encapsulates everything that I love about Starfield. Locations are very self-contained. You'll get quests in one location that will lead you to another, but for the most part, quests will feature one city and one city alone, because those quests are so integral to the cities they originate from. And by the time you've completed everything that Neon has to offer, Neon no longer feels like a city, 
but a character. Neon is a self-contained criminal hub area, where other locations' evils spread across the galaxy. What makes Neon so vile is always self-contained within the city, because it's designed that way by those at the very top. And it all starts with Aurora. Aurora is an illegal substance in Starfield, and the only place where you can legally buy it and use it is within the city of Neon. It's an addictive hallucinogenic derived from the fish native on the planet. Whilst Aurora can be used anywhere in Neon, you can only legally buy it from the Astral Lounge. Security is under strict instructions to not allow Aurora into the city by other illegal manufacturers coming from off-world, but also insists that it does not leave the planet as well. This is insisted by security under the guidance of Captain Benjamin Bayou. But things get a lot more sinister from here. Security is very strict against those who are addicted to Aurora, but cannot afford to obtain more, with security trained to make these people disappear. All attempts to become sober and get off off of Aurora are brought to a complete halt as well, as a man named the Administrator has been sending away ships bringing in medical supplies to the planet with the threats of violence. The Administrator will also turn out to be the man that owns the Astral Lounge, the man behind the sale of Aurora. So you go to confront him and... My time is far more valuable than you can possibly imagine. Captain Bayou? That's right, not only does Bayou run security and the Astral Lounge, but is also the CEO of the fishing company that made the city of Neon, the people manufacturing Aurora. Not only is this man making an illegal substance, cornering the market on Neon, being the only one allowed to sell it, but it has also an elite force of soldiers that will kill all the who try to sell the substance on the streets. And for those trying to get off the damn stuff, his security will send away supplies as they run the docks. Bayou Bayou has managed to create a city from the ground up, designed to get you addicted to an illegal substance that he manufactures and to game and you when you can't afford it anymore. And his villainy doesn't end with the trade of Aurora. Neon has a bustling market district within the city, with many interesting faces flooding those storefronts. My favourite though has to be Frank Rennick and his trusty robot sticks. Throughout Starfield, it is made very, very clear that robots are not sentient. They do not have feelings and everything is a simple calculation of mathematics until you meet Frank and he talks to you about how Styx is different. He talks like a person, he feels things, and is Frank's closest friend. Naturally, this is a surprise to you, so you take him at his word and you offer to mess up a few fellas that attacked and painted all over Styx, only for you to exit dialogue and realize that. Ah, <sighs> sometimes Styx, I wonder how things would have been different if I took a different path. If I flipped a coin of life and it came out heads instead of tails. I'm sorry, I did not understand your query. Please rephrase. Yeah, you got a point. I'm gonna screw it up either way. Oh! Oh, this man's just insane. The game is designed that through your interactions with one of the vendors, you are offered quests that will slowly lead you to interacting with all of the other vendors. It's actually quite clever. Take Saburo, for example. His business has been doing very poorly because he's an idiot and opened up a mining company on a planet 100% covered in oceans. He is desperate to get business booming and asks you to see if you can talk to at least five of the eight vendors into agreeing to a mutual ad brochure. The reason I'm rambling about these vendors is because Administrator Bayou has been taxing every one of these businesses 40% of all the income that they get. Again, every struggle you find on Neon either starts or is a consequence of Bayou's grip on the city. And Bayou's security is so vile that if you complete the Strikers questline, a questline that entails you joining a gang and fighting a gang war, Bayou will be so upset that you ended a gang war through the death of the Disciples, a now defeated gang, that he will recruit the Strikers into his security for so that they can conduct missions inciting more violence within the city that will result in more gangs taking root. Because it turns out, getting robbed blind by gangs tends to drive the citizens of Neon to, you guessed it, the purchase of Aurora. And with real estate being so cheap on Neon because of the gangs, even if those civilians die, there will always be someone looking for a fresh start and will move to Neon. But by far the best interaction you can have in Neon, and in my opinion, 
opinion, is the best written starter in the entire game can be found in Neon's Epside district. You walk up to an elderly woman and you try to talk to her, only for her to apologize as they are closed and she is just too emotional to talk right now. No matter how hard you try, she will insist that you go away and come back at a different time. And the game means this. You have to wait 24 hours of in-game time before she will even consider telling you what's on her mind. Like, can we please pause for a second here and think about how amazing that is? It is really hard to get a player's intrigue when every character just tells you that I'm sad, can you do a fetch quest for me? It's what you would typically expect from a game like Starfield. But Starfield goes the extra mile and doesn't tell you how sad a character is, it makes you feel it. The game forces you to ponder on why a character that so obviously has a quest for you would turn you away. I assumed that I would come back in 24 hours and she would be dead and there would be a murder mystery. The game is sending us away so that the shock factor hits us much harder on our return. But no, if you come back 24 hours later and she has had time to cool down, now if you ask her the same thing that you did yesterday, she is willing to open up to you. This character values your patience and now sees you as a person worth confiding in. Keep in mind that I haven't even told you what's got her upset and I know with 100% certainty that you are dying to know. And you know what? It will turn out to be a murder mystery. Someone murdered her husband and security refuses to look into it. And what's heartbreaking is that the only reason you were even able to interact with her is because her husband is gone. Her store shutters were meant to be closed when you first met her. She even tells you this. Hello. I'm sorry if I sound rude, but would you mind coming back later? We're actually closed right now. I just forget to pull down the shutters. The only reason that the shutters were still open and you were able to talk to her was because her husband at closing time would be the one to typically close the shutters. She forgot that he wasn't with her anymore. And that's why she choked up and requested that you leave. And that is just... Such amazing writing for a character that we have had a grand total of two minutes of interaction time. This is the sort of thing that you can expect with Starfield and its handcrafted content. Cities have themes and their quests enforce those themes home with a vengeance. Aquila is a western town that makes you feel like a gun-toting sheriff or a champion of the little guy. And Neon floods your mind with depictions of manipulation and presents you with an endless cycle of a governing entity running his city like his own person. Personal wallet. And I love it. Ah, <sighs> anyway, on to our next segment titled Why the rest of Starfield's exploration is complete dog shit. Okay, that's not fair. Whilst adventuring through the stars, you will bump into some really fascinating interactions. I for one found a ship, one of the crewmates as a joke changed everyone's names within the ship's computer systems to be dumb nicknames. This ship belongs to a team of spaces that try out experimental products. One crewmate will set up turrets throughout the ship and connect them to that ship. He wants to kill everyone and steal these products to, in order to sell them on the black market. Once they've lifted off, he tells the computer system to kill all the crewmates, excluding him by name. However, his name has been changed in the system to a nickname, and the turrets end up killing him along with the rest of the crew. It's tragic, but man. That's just fucking funny. There's a cute little grandma you can bump into and she'll offer you tons of food. There are space pirates and bounty hunters that will just attack you at a moment's notice. And you've even got this little shit. Do you know the way to Uranus? I sure hope so. It's right behind you. Okay, and before you all scream at me, yes, there are these fuckers. Thanks for responding to my hail. We've been trying to contact you about your ship's extended warranty. Are you happy now? Cool! Here's why Starfield's exploration is complete and utter dog shit. Excluding cities, there are. <clears throat> they're they're kind of cool. Starfield's exploration is some of the most embarrassing shit I've ever seen. However, I'd like to defend Starfield a little bit before going on. What we are about to talk about is completely optional content. Even outside of planetary exploration, there are hundreds of hours worth of content on the settled systems. Settled being planets with either cities or star systems with satellite battle stations. 
Everything outside of that is a bonus and we should be grateful that they tried. But the word tried is doing some serious fucking legwork because exploring planets in this game sucks balls. You land on a planet and there is just nothing. Nine times out of ten you'll land on a planet with one biome, a maximum of two recycled alien species, and the same three encounters over and over again. Abandoned laboratories, abandoned factories, or a research outpost. With the likelihood of there being pirates stalking the holes being as high as the building I'm going to jump off if I have to explore one more of these planets. In the space of four hours I traveled to three planets. I found a cool desert grasslands planet where 900 meters from my ship, there was an abandoned outpost. So I walked there. <coughs> I encountered a goofy dead guy with his like glitching backpack and uh, and I walked inside and found blood splattered all over the walls. And I went on to kill some bad guys. That was fun. Only for me to travel to one planet over and experience the exact same abandoned outpost. No, not just a similar outpost, literally copied and pasted all the way down to the glitching out backpack. You can see me in this footage realize that this is the same backpack and I rush inside to see if the same dead body is there. And yep, there it is. Only to keep exploring and one hour later on a different planet again. Yep, you guessed it. I found the exact same outpost once more. But credits where it's due, guys. At least the backpack wasn't glitching out now, you know. Where credit is due. Am I saying due? Do is it due or due? I'm saying it like weird. I don't know. Planetary exploration is a simple resource grind, and while I'm not overly impressed, it's a way to grind out levels and gather tons of resources in order to make the parts of the game you actually care about easier. I also find it interesting that Bethesda, in a tweet, insisted you should go explore random planets because who knows what you might find out there, and posts a cool underground mining location. But hey, Bethesda. That location is from the Freestar Ranger quest line, not some random planet. Hell, someone points this out in the replies. You aren't fooling anyone. Planetary exploration is a huge load of empty, and where you do find something to do, you'll find yourself doing the same shit in the same empty nothingness of a planet on repeat until you realize where the real fun is, the cities. But overall, the exploration in Starfield is sensational. Cities are full of life, and where the planets let you you down, these beautiful locations won't. But exploration is not the only thing you'll be getting up to in Starfield. Now exploration on its own can be very fun, but what's adventuring worth without a little bit of problem? Okay look, combat is combat. We love shooting and hitting things, whether that be on the ground, in the air, or in outer space. There are only so many things that I can praise when it comes to gunplay in a first person shooter, so I'll say this. The shooting feels good, and the space combat feels better. It's clear that the developers put their heart and soul into making this the best combat that they've ever developed. What does piss me off is the overinflated process of being able to conduct combat in your own way. I've got two things to complain about, okay? Number one, weapon modding. Weapon modding is elaborate, and if it was as simple as investing a skill point into a skill tree, I'd be totally happy. That's what they did in Fallout 4, and I loved it. But Starfield has managed to take the joys of upgrading your weapons and flushed it down the toilet. Let's say that I'm a fresh character. I want to give my weapon a specific grip. I need to level up at least six times before I can put a skill point into weapon modding. Then I have to go to the nearest research station, collect the random items from all the vendors in order Order to research the grip, then I have to go back to the vendors to buy the elements and materials I need to be able to make the grip, then I can finally attach the grip to my gun. Wait! No I can't, because it's a level 2 grip, and I research level 1 grips. That's okay, I'll research level 2 grips, go get the resources, research level 2 grips, and sorry, you can't make that grip as you only have one point in gun modding. Well that's okay, I've got a spare skill point, I'll just throw it into gun modding and- oh, ho, 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 ho. 
No, you're not doing that. You need to make at least five weapon mods before you can put another point into this skill tree. Think about that. You need to level up enough in order to enable gun modding so you can mod up guns that you don't care about in order to level up gun modding to level two so you can have the privilege of researching a gun mod in order to attach a grip. Doesn't seem all that bad until you realize that every single attachment has this tedious system. Grips, stocks, sights, barrels, internals. Not to mention that there are four level variants to each. Level one grip, level two grip, level two megs, level four fuck. There are so many things to do in Starfield. Why are you stopping players and forcing them to do all this tedious shit? Modifying weapons is what you do before going off to have fun with your new toys. So why are you making the privilege of the thought of modifying weapons a chore. Like, why are there challenges I need to complete in order to put points into this shit? If I have four skill points and I want to dive deep into, I don't know, uh, taking less environmental damage, they are forcing you to take environmental damage before you can put another point into it. I want to take less environmental damage and to do so, I have to take environmental damage. Are you insane? Forcing the player to grind out a task that's meant to be fun in order to make it viable and more more fun is deranged. Not everything needs to have a threshold. If the player wants to do 40% more damage and put four points into pistols, let them. You don't need to make them work for it. The working for it was the leveling up. You know, them playing your game. You are rewarding players with busy work for them wanting to have fun. That's the thing about combat in Starfield. It's all about what you make it. But if you're gonna turn the gameplay earned skill points into a chore, the gameplay's gonna suffer for it. The second thing I wanna complain about is number two, the powers. Yeah, so things are about to get a tad spoily here, and the next segment will be diving into the story, so if you care about that sort of thing, you should probably go. Without going too deep into it right now, through completing elements of the main quest, you will find temples related to the artifacts we talked about in chapter one. By traveling to these temples, you'll obtain special powers per temple. And these powers at first are super fun. The ability to see your enemies through walls, turning off gravity, or my favorite, literally the shout from Skyrim. These powers add flavor to combat interactions. So much flavoring that you'll forget what the original game tasted like. Powers break the game's balancing and end up making the game way, way too easy. The game has no idea when or how you're going to be using these powers and has no way of balancing in order to compensate. For me personally, the game got so easy that I ended up not using the powers at all. I just disabled them. But what's really insulting is how useless these powers powers will end up being when you actually need them. Very, very late into the main quest line, you'll be confronted by two beings who have dedicated their lives to stealing and obtaining these powers, and you're placed in a race against time to obtain these artifacts and these powers in order to have a chance of beating them in the final boss fight, should that be where you direct the story to go. The purest encapsulation of a race against time and the first proper incentive to hunt down these temples of power only for you to get to the final boss fight and have the enemies be completely immune to them. The game gives you such a new and interesting way in engaging in combat to the point that their game becomes too easy only for you to finally need them and they do completely nothing. How do I know this? Because the game just tells you. Okay, some of these are still effective, like seeing enemy through walls or if you're boring, a damage orb. But what's insulting is that you've fought this kind of guy before. And guess what? They weren't immune to these powers. But during the climax of the game, a game about a race against time to obtain the powers of a god, said powers do bum f nothing. What's worse is that it's not like these bosses are large and they can't be pushed over. It's just a guy. But there's 10 of him. I haven't even gotten into who these wankers actually are. And don't worry, we'll, we'll be getting to that real soon. But before we can talk about the mind numbing brain fart that is the main quest line, I, uh, yeah, I've got something I need to handle first.
now that that's over, we should probably start talking about the story. Mission update. The Dreadnought has been destroyed and the target's still alive. You have failed your mission, Lilith. Exit the simulation and report to General Akron for re-evaluation. He's not happy with your performance. A lot of people don't seem to believe me when I tell them that Starfield's main quest line is extremely short. Outside of the opening that we've already discussed, there are only really six main missions. The rest of the main story consists of an elaborate range of fetch quests that you don't even need to complete in order to finish the story. But let's not get hung up on the small shit. Let's begin with our characters. Constellation is an arrangement of characters seeking out the artifacts simply for the fact that there is nothing known about where they came from. In the beginning, you can barely call them artifacts. It really is just a bunch of rocks with unknown origins. The team consists of Noel, Barrett, Andrea, Sam, Matteo, Walter, Vladimir, and Sarah. You can include the robot, but he's not really a character, so we're gonna leave him out. Noel is the team's head researcher, with many of the team's deductions being based in science deriving from her findings. Barrett is Constellation's action man and handles in-person interactions that would require diplomacy in times of well-needed charm. Andrea is my beautiful wife and I will kill anyone who dares speak to her. Andrea, similar to Barrett, is one of the team's people of action, but dedicates her time to surveying landmarks that would lead to finding more artifacts. Sam is a man of galactic knowledge, as he has coasted across the known galaxy for most of his life. When you need information on a planet and its culture, he's the man to go to. Mateo is a spiritual guide into the unknown, and acts as the team's angel on their shoulder, constantly speculating on grounded research, allowing for more open-ended questions on the religious and spiritual meanings behind behind the artifacts. Walter is a billionaire and wait, a billionaire? Not on my planet you don't! Walter is Constellation's wallet. That is about it and he'll even tell you that. Me? <laughs> Why, I'm the wallet. Vladimir is in charge of surveillance and spends most of his time finding where future artifacts can be unlocked. Sarah is British. Once you've completed all the quests gathering up everyone of Constellation, your first true mission of intrigue begins, with you being sent out by Vladimir to investigate a reading much larger than those of the artifacts. Only for you to head out and find a temple. Head in and you'll be greeted by some spinning rings. Float around and touch all the lights around the room and the rings will harmonize and grant the player with some kind of power. Power that materializes as special abilities. Now I've already bitched about these powers in chapter Chapter 3, so we aren't going to go over the same stuff. What I want to talk about here though is how underwhelming the process of obtaining these powers really is. You find a temple, you float around, get a power, and you're given one bad guy to test it on, and that is it. There are tons of these temples scattered across Starfield's universe, and every single one of them is the exact fucking same. Touch the floating lights, harmonize, kill, repeat. No dungeon, no interesting boss fights, no puzzles, no no riddles, not even an enemy guarding the entrance to the temple, which is such an underwhelming experience because you are never put in a situation where you will ever need to use these powers. To the point that, for the most part, I forgot that they even existed. I'm not going to say that you cannot have fun with these powers, but there is definitely no real joy in obtaining them. Following this mission, you demonstrate your powers to the team, which they somehow knew you had despite me not telling them, whatever. But after this, you do get to go on a really cool adventure. Walter has set up a meeting with a thief on Neon that says they have an artifact and that they are willing to sell. After heading out to this mission, it'll turn out that it is stolen, no shit, he's a thief, but it previously belonged to another billionaire, Slayton and now you're in deep shit. Your only real way to deal with this is by sneaking through Slayton's mega structure in order to find him and deal with this one on one. And where credit is due, you can talk him out of killing you, but only if Walter's company does a partial merger with Slayton's. It's 
kind of cool. But the stealth in this mission in order to even get to Slayton sucks ass. I was hoping I'd be able to complete this mission with no casualties. But on this corner, no matter how I approach it, the enemies, despite looking the other way, always spot me. And what's worse is that this isn't even a choice I get to make. Over the comms, Walter's wife is guiding us through the building and instructs you to go down the hall into this room here in order to get past security. But the game refuses to let me pass through without enemies getting alerted. Regardless if you manage to stealth your way through or just go guns blazing, you take the artifact and you can either leave peacefully or through killing Slayton, depending on how you want to approach things. Also, a quick heads up, Slayton's voiced by Ryan Hart, so uh, I thought that I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it's moments like this that really makes Neon the best place to do business. You steal what's mine. I trap you in the city. You infiltrate my office. I lock it down. Where else can you match wits for the highest stakes but here? <laughs> You've finally got the artifact and you're ready to jump to light speed when this happens. You hold something you have no right to. My people have killed for this, but I will offer you one chance to hand over the artifact and turn away from this path. Well, that's not any type of ship I recognize. The fact that you do not know says much. We are the Starborn and you are unworthy to possess the artifacts. Holy shit, like, holy shit. This is what I wanted. Mystery, intrigue, who the f are the Starborn. From here on out, the Starborn are a new faction that you'll have to worry about. They will jump out of light speed and just fuck you up in a space battle, or you can find them with random encounters on planets. By doing the main quest, the world of Starfield has changed forever. After your encounter with the Starborn, it is a race against time in order to obtain the other artifacts. You gather up everyone with the plans to upgrade the Eye, Constellation's personal space station, in order to find more temples and artifacts. This is where the event happens. What I call the event is the turning point of this game, where you will either love it or hate it. For me, it's a bit of both. From here, you will lose your ability to pick your own companion, which was really irritating, but it's because Starfield is preparing to kick you in the nuts. Hard. For me, I got stuck with Barrett, and it's for a good reason. I don't really like Barrett, I think he is super annoying and really cocky in a way that just doesn't come across as charming. And you know what? The game knows that I don't like Barrett. What Starfield is doing here is taking all four of the companions in Constellation, Sam, Sarah, Andrea, and Barrett, and will compile them where they need to be for the next act of the game. The three characters you have the most affiliation with will be locked away on the eye, with the fourth being your lowest affiliation being your forced companion. You'll be sent out to steal an artifact as a main quest, but when you return with the artifact, something isn't right. Noelle can't get a hold of the eye. No one is responding. Until you hear Vladimir call out for help, stating that they are under attack by a lone Starborn, that they are headed to the lodge, and that Sam, one of the player companions, is bleeding out fast. But before you can process any of this, you are contacted by the Hunter. Hello, Constellation. Are you there? Who are you? What did you do to our friends? They called me the Hunter. And now that I'm here, your part in glimpsing the unity is over. I'm already on my way. Say goodbye to your friends. It won't be long. Here is where the game gives you an impossible choice. What do you do? Do you remain at the lodge and keep everyone here safe, or do you head to the eye and try to save the others? Keep in mind at this point, you do not know if anyone on the eye is going to make it, and that all of the artifacts are here, located at the lodge. Do you head to the eye, or do you stay at the lodge? The choice that you make here has massive implications for the rest of the game, and I love this. Remember how I said the game locks you into having companions? Sam was locked into being my companion when I went
went off to do side quests, meaning I built up a ton of affiliation with that character, which is exactly why he is the one bleeding out on the space station. Depending on who you spend the most time with in Starfield, they are the one destined to die if you do not head to the space station. For me, my choices were go save Sam or stay and protect the others. The hunter is on his way to the lodge no matter what I pick. This is such a fascinating choice to give the player, so much so that I took too long deciding that I wanted to leave the lodge. I go to, but as Barrett is telling me he's gonna lock the door behind me, the hunter is already in the room with us and assaulting Walter. A massive fight ensues, with you barely escaping with your life and sadly, with me staying at the lodge, Sam doesn't make it. The game puts you in the hardest spot imaginable. Do you save your favorite character and potential lover but lose all the artifacts, or do you stay and protect all of your hard work? By the time it's all over, the sky is black with the burning ashes of the conflict. Sam is dead, and the team has no idea where to go from here. Starfield insists on killing your favorite character if you do not make the wise choice. But if I was to go off and save Sam, Barrett, the lowest of affiliated character is the one destined to die at the hands of the hunter. No matter what you do, the team loses anyway. It is a low blow for you and the team, but it motivates you to stand up, fight back, and obtain the artifacts before the hunter beats you to it. Hate to be a bummer though, but there is a lot wrong with how this all turns out. The conflict here is that either you protect the artifacts or save your best friend. But if you go to save your favorite character, the hunter doesn't actually end up taking the artifacts, even though he says he's going to, and only kills a character that by design, you literally don't give a fuck about. It really is pretty obvious what choice the player should be making here, but the game lies to you about the consequences of this choice by pretending you'll lose the artifacts. Also, fighting the hunter takes place in an open public space. You, security, and even civilians are all defending themselves and attacking the hunter. But if you accidentally land a single shot on security or civilians running in front of you, every NPC, including Constellation, will turn on you instantly. Here's Mateo killing me because a civilian ran in front of my gun. What's worse though, is I don't give a rat's ass about Sam dying. The game thinks I care about the companion because they locked me into having him at the start of the game after the second mission with Constellation. By the time the game assumed I'd be sad if Sam died, Andrea was my love interest. But because I was forced to have Sam early, the game mistakens him for my favorite companion. Again, what the fuck is with this game locking you into having companions? It ruins this setup in the game. At the end of all of it though, the game makes you think you made a hard choice. And from here, the future of Constellation is unclear. But hold on, the hunter said something about the unity. They call me the hunter. And now that I'm here, your part in glimpsing the unity is over. What is the Unity? New mission, find out what Unity is. From here, the game forces you down the path of exploring all the lame ass lore about all of the religions. You speak to this guy and through his religious wisdom, he transcribes the first ever recorded acknowledgement of something vaguely describing the Unity. Legend speaks of a man named the Pilgrim, an undying being full of knowledge. And through him, you may be able to discover what the Unity is, where to travel to find the Hunter and the other Starborn that attacked you when you were with Walter hunting for the artifact. Outside of the setup, I love this mission. There's no shooting, there's no violence, all you have to do is read. You go out seeking a man only to arrive at his sanctum and realize that this place has been deserted. But through this man's diaries, you're able to get not only a glimpse into who the pilgrim was, but more importantly, what the unity might be. The credulous simplicity of mundane humans never ceases to amaze me. My worst instincts draw me towards a form of contempt for them. But I remember that I am privy to that which they are not. I cannot and should not judge them for a lack of vision when I know very well the blinders which obscure their sight. I once wore them myself, after all. I hope for their sake that they may someday understand, but for my sake, I wish to be left alone. 
So, here is the crux of my troubles. To accomplish anything, I need to work with other people. I need assistants, I need workers, I need hands. And as we work together, they inevitably ask questions, and I can never help talking. It starts innocently enough. They want to understand how someone who believes in science can also believe in the divine. Or they have their own misunderstanding instilled by some borderline religious remnant. My weakness is my inability to let alone. I want them to understand, so I try, gently as I might, to nudge their minds along the right path. Then there are the follow-ups and followings. The, the trouble is, is that I genuinely care for these people. It would be so much easier if I don't. Today, in a soft voice, my assistant asked me if there was anything above the unity. It was all I could do to keep from shouting that I could scarcely comprehend the misunderstanding that would lead to such a question. It was asked honestly, and I answered as best I could. But if even my closest confidant here can fail to grasp the most basic of these truths, why am I bothering to explain any of it to them? Every word that drops from my mouth gets gobbled up, misheard, misremembered, misunderstood, and mistranslated before I can issue the slightest clarification. People are necessary, but people are madness. I attempted to withdraw, to go off alone, to commune with the unity in my own way, and they followed. <laughs> of course they followed. At last, a bit of peace. The peace of peace. Is that anything? Is that funny? Wait, why am I trying to be funny? Have they driven me mad at last? Is there any difference between writing to myself and talking to myself? I mean, the former certainly seems more acceptable than the latter. I recall again that my mind is my own, and that even if only it exists, there is sufficient for me to believe in everything else. The unity has restored me once more, and this time I act alone for now. Myself is a formidable opponent. I should have expected as much, but vanity is, thankfully, not among my vices. Regardless, it turns out time spent in solitude is, in my case, time with a very sick man. Whatever it is I've become, I don't like this person. I find myself thinking about his various pasts and possible futures. I imagine continuing on the road, acquiring more power, more knowledge, more development of myself. I imagine passing through once more to another world to begin the process anew. What is notable here, the road does seem gratifying. Every step is one of intrinsic reward and I feel myself anticipating the pleasures and seeing a more contented version of myself in that future. Then, for the sake of considering all possibilities, I imagine if I took a different path. If I stopped running, stopped seeking to gather my own power, if I instead embraced the twinges of compassion I feel in my heart and let myself care for the people who seem to gather about me wherever I try to work. If I simply lived and taught and perhaps brought others to the light and died. That road also seems gratifying. I also see a contented version of myself in that future. Here is the difference though, when I stop thinking about the glories I could achieve for myself, the pleasure fades nearly immediately. When I stop thinking about staying and building something, the feeling endures. There's something more sustaining about it, more fulfilling. I don't know what this difference signifies, but I'm grateful for the time I've taken to notice it. Through the environmental storytelling, it's clear to see that in the end, the pilgrim remained and died fulfilled. And through this knowledge, you are able to grasp that the unity might offer some kind of immortality. But trust me, it is so much more than that. By reading these diaries, you're able to unlock a door. And in another diary entry, the pilgrim grants you the knowledge you seek. And you are able to travel to where you assume the unity should be. But instead, you come face to face with the hunter and the emissary. Hello again. <laughs> Do you remember the emissary, perhaps? And their ship, the Helix? I believe they ambushed you above Neon and demanded that artifact you worked so hard to gain. Thank you for the stellar introduction. Your success is unprecedented. Before you came, we were just discussing how continued use of force against you is unwise. 
The Hunter and the Emissary are both starborn with different threads of belief when it comes to the Unity. Massive spoiler here, folks. The Unity is a being that grants you a gateway into the multiverse. No, 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 stay with me now. The Unity is a being that grants you the gateway into the multiverse, a transcendent gift that grants any being worthy of the title to become starborn. And in being starborn, you are able to traverse the multiverse as you wish. Through this multiversal travel, Starborn may obtain more power from multiples of the artifacts and perpetually become more powerful. Where the Hunter and the Emissary differ though, is how the unity must be preserved. The Hunter wishes to see the artifacts be fought over, as the gift of becoming Starborn is a title earned, and every Starborn that has ever come into existence has been birthed into the world through the fighting of this power. It is tradition, it is death. The Emissary, however, wishes to bring a form of order to the chaos, and feels that beings must be vetted before becoming Starborn, as the power of Starborn is a power unlike any other, and should be used with responsibility. There is a twist though, folks. The Emissary is Starborn, but they are also... Uh, Sam. So, uh, I gotta say, this part is more awkward than I thought. Hiding my face was way easier. This Sam is from a universe where you were on the eye, and he was the one at the lodge, and you were the one to lose your life to one variant of the hunter. Which would have been a really cool twist. And credit where's due, this is a very interesting twist. However, it would have been a cool twist, um, if I gave a rat's fucking ass about Sam! Again! Bethesda! Why did you write your game to have so many segments locking me into having particular characters? Why? This whole twist was fucked up and ruined because instead of Andrea dying, Sam did! Do you know how fucking sick this would have been if I watched the woman I love die? and then she turned out to be a Starborn. From here, the player is asked who is right. What philosophy best suits the path of the Unity and what one do you wish to go down? But before you can make such a choice, the Emissary will encourage you to go off and investigate the moon, Earth's moon, before making such a choice. And what you will find out is mind blowing. There are two missions after this meeting, the moon investigation and what I like to call the anomaly. The anomaly is hands down the coolest quest in Starfield. You get a distress call from a man named Raphael, only to arrive at the designated location and find out that Raphael is dead and died weeks ago. You are told this by a man named Hughes, who lets you into the building to discuss the distress signal, and then this happens. The lab is now rotted, destroyed, and overgrown with alien life. When you go off to investigate, you meet Raphael, the man who sent out the distress signal. You tell him that a man named Hughes let you into the building, and he is shocked at this news because Hugh and the rest of the staff at this research base died weeks ago. What the fuck is going on? It'll turn out that this outpost was stress testing an artifact until it ruptured, collapsing into a time rip and causing two potential outcomes from this outpost, overlapping on one one another. This isn't an entirely new universe, just two possibilities fighting over the same reality. It is so cool seeing elements of the multiverse that were introduced to you by the Emissary Hunter being present in the actual game. You're able to blink between the possibilities in order to reach the artifact, but by taking the artifact, you are also given a hard choice. Which reality do you make the permanent one? The reality where Raphael is the only survivor, or the one where everyone else lives? But through investigation, it's hinted that Raphael's world is deep rooted to reality, as everyone else was supposed to die in that explosion that caused the rip. He just got lucky. Do you let Raphael's luck ring true and bring balance to how things are supposed to be, or do you twist fate and allow the outpost to survive without 
Raphael. I went with Raphael because he's just so cute with his little moustache. Haha. <laughs> okay, on to the moon quest, which will inevitably lead you to Earth. As much as I like this next quest, I don't want to drag it out because of its twist. It doesn't really affect the player, and it's more just for world building. Through the game, you use a gravity drive in order to fold space and time and travel across the universe, basically light speed or teleportation. The emissary sent you to the moon and in turn Earth so you could find out the truth about the gravity drive drive and what really happened to Earth 300 years ago. Earth is a barren dead wasteland of a planet and it's been that way for hundreds and hundreds of years but before its demise scientists on the moon made the discovery of the gravity drive and the gravity drive was made possible through the research and the first ever discovery of an artifact but as it'll turn out there were side effects to using the gravity drives. I know what I'm seeing Victor. The data coming back from the satellites is very clear. It's the grav drives. All those jumps from the moon. At this rate, Earth's atmosphere is going to start sputtering out into space. Can the drives be fixed? I'm working on some designs that should discreetly solve the problem. Under the guise of an emergency update to the fueling pumps. We're talking about the end of Earth, and you're trying to be subtle about it. Judith, the last thing we need is people losing faith in grab drive technology. That might be our only option. To what? Are you seriously saying we should abandon Earth? The timeline is under 50 years. A blink of an eye for a planet, but more than enough time for a human exodus. And what do we tell people? We say it's an act of God. One that science has found a solution for. Time for humanity to take its place in the stars. You know, didn't you? You lied to me. I... All this time, I dedicated my life to this discovery, Victor. And you knew we were going to kill off our planet? You haven't seen the future I've seen. There's an infinite expanse of promise out there. A meteor could have hit Earth. A plague, another world war. Colonizing other galaxies secures humanity's future for all coming generations, across all time. At the expense of our home. Stop it, both of you. All that matters is building enough ships to get everyone off this planet. And we need to start now. I'll draft up a statement. We'll need to address the entire international community. The man heading the research in this scenario is hinted to be a starborn, and through his actions not only did he manage to kill Earth, but also sent humanity to the stars, hinting that he did so, so it would become easier to find artifacts across the stars if humanity was already settled among those stars. This right here enforces the emissary's argument. He fights for free will, but because of a starborn's thirst for artifacts echoing across the universe, humans never got the choice of whether they actually actually wanted to leave Earth. However, the hunter does make a good counterpoint, that if the emissary really did care about free will, he wouldn't be stopping those who are not starborn from ascending into the unity. Don't you see? The power of the artifact forced humanity to the stars. They didn't get to make a choice. How many would have chosen Earth? You see the hypocrisy in what the emissary is saying, right? They don't want to rob people of their free will, but then they steal the artifacts for themselves. From here, you can pick a side. Or you can just realize they're both power hungry and you can go at things alone. Which is what I personally went with. From here on out, it is a battle for the artifacts. The final boss fight decides if you ascend and become starborn. I do have to say something though, it does fuck me off that they both agree that you have an equal turn to becoming starborn and that they'll meet you at the burial site where the final artifact is. When you're ready, the hunter and I will be at the buried temple. That's where we'll settle things. Meaning, we'll kill you. But hey, at least we'll wait till you get there. 
Everyone deserves a shot at the final artifact. Only for them to not only surprise attack you in space beforehand, but will also have their starborn lackeys try to stop you along the way. It goes from a clash of two gods and a mere man to having to fight an entire army of bullshit. So in the end, I feel like I made the right choice in turning on both of these fuckers. What gripes me about the whole situation is the game isn't written like they try to deceive you. They straight up will meet you at the burial site and say, okay, it's time for that fair chance. None of this was fair. The final boss fight sucks complete ass though. As I said in chapter three, your powers are completely useless. The battle arenas are all just recycled places you've already been through in the main quest line. But instead of this being a harsh battle of wit and strategy in a 2v1, instead you fight two guys that multiply themselves into 20. Oh, and they also just have human foot soldiers there that aren't starborn at all. And this fight is so unfair and so crowded that you can actually kill one of them and you won't even notice. Just listen to how much I lost my mind after the boss fight. I'm saying that I beat the bosses, but I didn't even fucking know that I killed one of them. He's just dead. The emissary is like, that's it. We're gonna finish this. I'm like, I don't fucking know you. I don't care about you. The hunter killed my friend. That's the big bad guy. So I killed this little cunt and then I get to go fucking kill the big guy. The really cool big- Oh, it's the big boy. He's the hunter. Ooh, he's been doing this forever, you know? Maybe I was a little bit distracted because I was fucking shooting 17 of the same fucking goddamn guy. But you were watching. Did you notice he died? There was no indication that the hunter- There was no indication. Not a fucking peep. I didn't even want to fight you. I wanted to fight the other guy. He's dead. I fucking unalived him. And I didn't even know it. Fucking $120 for a video game where you can accidentally kill the final boss of the fucking game and not even notice. Hi, Zenny here, editing the video. So I just looked at the gameplay footage and it will turn out that everything is worse than I thought it was. What the game does is despawns the emissary and the hunter so that it can engage the boss fight, but then they don't respawn the hunter. So it'll turn out that the game despawned the hunter and spawned in two different variants of the emissary, which is exactly why I have no fucking memory of, of Killing the hunter! The game despawns him whilst he is alive and respawns a corpse. <laughs> what results from this fight is all of the artifacts that you didn't go get just happening to be on the bodies of these two guys because the game is too scared to send you away to do 10 fetch quests after such an embarrassing boss fight. You can go and say goodbye to all your friends, and when you are ready, you can finally activate your grav drive, and you will finally, finally travel to the Unity. Holy shit, that... Holy shit, that's me! You made it. I hope you're enjoying the view. I never get tired of staring at it. Eternity. From here, all you have to do is step into eternity and you will become starborn. With the catch that you will have to leave everything behind. Hold on! Is this just an elaborate way to set up New Game Plus? Is... Is that it? You lose all your progression, your weapons, your ships, your companions, and for what? The ability to get more powers? Great, I can't wait to do more of these temples and bounce around and touch more lights to get more powers that I won't fucking use. Oh my God, that sounds like so much fun. I understand as a storytelling tool, becoming Starborn is a super gratifying way to end the game, but Starfield shouldn't end the main quest line with you having to start everything from the beginning again. I 
forget that you get to keep your levels, okay? That's fine. But this is the same shit Bethesda did with Fallout 3. Bethesda, it's been 15 years. How are you making this same mistake? The purest gratifying feeling for a player is to finish a main quest line and then go off and do the side content. I don't want to lose all my gear, all my friends, and the ship I worked my fucking ass off to make just so I can have a gratifying ending to your fucking quest line. Bethesda, I don't understand. Why do you like hurting me like this? Ah! So here's the important question. Should you buy Starfield? Honestly? Yeah. I can't stand the way the game opens, its restrictive leveling system, and the way it ends. But this game is so much more than its main questline. It's the journey that you make for yourself. There is a lot that Starfield has to offer that I just don't have the time to talk about. Only that's a lie. I actually don't want to talk about it. I want you to buy this game, get through its drawn out opening and have a good time because there is a lot of fun to be had out there. You know, somewhere in the Starfield. A big thank you to everyone that watched this video to the very end. If you could please subscribe and leave a comment, I'd really appreciate it. I want to know what you liked about this video. I want to know what you think I'm wrong about. I love reading comments and sometimes I'll even respond. That, that's a lie. I respond to nearly everything because I don't have a life. A big thank you to my patrons on the screen and an even bigger thank you to Papa Sun, Nicole, and our newest tier two member, Fancy Feet with threes instead of E's. It is a privilege making content for you all and I give you my word, I'm gonna be making these kinds of videos until the day I die. Here are a few videos you might enjoy if you like this sort of long form breakdown and critique. Uh, my name is Zenny and I'll see you in the next one, I guess.